Okay, so it is the regular council meeting of Monday, March 28th, 2022. It is 6 p.m. I'm calling this meeting to order. Just a reminder of everyone that this webinar is being recorded by Zoom and it will be published to the city's YouTube site. So the first item is adoption of the minutes. There's three <coughs> sets of minutes today, governance and operations committee meeting of February 28th, 2022 the regular council meeting of February 28, 2022, and the governance and operations committee meeting of March 14th, 2022. The recommendation is that all three sets of minutes as, as listed be adopted as circulated. Does anyone see any errors or omissions? And is anyone willing to make that motion? I'll move. Councillor Gattafoni Robinson and Councillor Doby, are you seconding or do you see any errors or omissions? And you're on mute. Okay, I'd just like to go back to the Monday, March 14th, Government Operations Committee meeting, uh, point 3.1 point to do with council stipends. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so the second motion that went through that was that the annual council indemnities paid be increased by 2% equivalent to the wage increase provided to the city's unionized workforce. <coughs> so that vote went through. I think it was a four to three vote. And I'd just like some clarifications since on the first motion, it was put out by um, the mayor yourself that we'd accept a 0% increase. And that motion was turned down. So then we went to the second motion. So in view of those, um, yourself and the uh, councillors that objected to the 2% increase, and yet we voted through that, that we voted that that 2% increase went through. I would just like some clarification. Does that mean that yourself, Councillor Butler and Councillor Santori do not get the 2% increase? <laughs> Ms. McIsaac, do you wanna take care of that one? Um, no, despite the voting, the 2% increase would apply to both the mayor's position and to all members of council. And that is how the bylaw has been prepared for presentation and first, second and third readings at tonight's meeting. Okay, so I would assume that that was correct when I asked that question, but each of those three people do have the option of turning it down themselves, right? That's coming up here later, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions on that, on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, so I need a motion to uh, adopt as circulated. Councillor Butler, do I have someone to second? Councillor Jones, thank you. Any other questions, comments? All in favor? Against, if any? Carried. Public question period. So Ms. McIsaac, just go to you first. Do you have any written submissions that have come in or any questions your way? Nothing has come to me, but uh, as Ms. Lucini indicated, there is someone upstairs in the council chambers. Right. Uh, Ms. Lucini, is there someone in the council chambers that wishes to address council? No. No, just no. here just to observe here. today. Okay, great. Okay, so public question period is then done. Correct, Ms. McIsaac? Great, thank you very much. Item number 3.1 is 459 Rosslyn Avenue application for development variance permit. And Ms. McIsaac, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Your Worship. The city is in receipt of an application for a development variance permit from the property owner, Morley Ballard of 459 Rosslyn Avenue. He is looking for a development variance permit to vary sections 3, 8, F, and 8, 6 of the city zoning bylaw pertaining to the redevelopment of the property. The property owner of 459 Roslyn Avenue has made this application. The property was destroyed by fire some time ago, and the owner is proposing to construct a new single family dwelling on the property. Development on the Roslyn Avenue property is constrained by the Trail Creek culvert, which bisects the property. And so in planning for the placement of the single fa family dwelling on the property, a request to reduce the front yard setback and 
the setback that's required from the Trail Creek culvert has been advanced by the property owner. I'll speak first to the Trail Creek culvert. Section 38F of the city's zoning bylaw requires that any building or structure be set back three meters from the Trail Creek culvert. This setback is in place to protect the integrity of the culvert. The setback should only be varied if the integrity of the culvert is protected, which involves constructing any footings or foundations so they do not interfere with the culvert and ensuring that no portion of any building rests on the culvert. Mr. Ballard has retained WSA Engineering to provide structural engineering services for the foundation of the proposed dwelling on the property. And as included in the correspondence that's attached to the staff reporting, WSA Engineering is satisfied that there is an engineering solution that will allow the proposed construction as proposed within the setback area without negatively impacting the culvert. I'll speak then to the front yard setback. Pursuant to section 86 of the zoning bylaw, a minimum front yard of 1.2 meters is required for the hillside single family residential zone, uh, which this property is zoned. The owner is requesting that the required front yard be reduced from 1.2 meters to 0.3 meters to allow the building to be sited on the property, taking also into account the setback from the Trail Creek culvert. In order to allow this proposed construction um, to occur, council can do so by issuing a development variance permit. As to the foundation and having uh, an engineered review, to ensure that the Trail Creek culvert is not negatively impacted by the construction. It is felt appropriate that a reduction in the required three meter setback can and should be authorized uh, by council so that development on the property can occur. Uh, that uh, also though, to be taken into consideration is the front yard setback and Council should consider if there's any impacts on the neighboring properties or the neighborhood as a result of that reduction in, in front yard setback. Given this property's location on Rosin Avenue and the adjacent development, um, it wasn't felt by staff that there'd be any undue hardship um, to the neighboring properties that would material affect uh, them but as is required when issuing or considering the issuance of a develop, development variance permit, uh, all property owners and occupants within 50 meters of the subject property have been notified of council's consideration of the matter at tonight's meeting and have been invited to express any concerns they might have uh, through to council. Um, it would be appropriate at this time um, to hear from anyone in the gallery who may have um, questions or concerns around the issuance of the de development variance permit. I do know that I see that Robert Zaretsky is here and he is representing the property owner. And it does look like we have a caller who has joined um, who may have uh, comments or questions with respect to this item. Uh, and then once we hear from uh, anyone in the, in the gallery with respect to the matter, uh, I will um, come back to the recommendation um, that's contained for council's consideration. Okay, so at this point, I will call forward Mr. Zaretsky if you would like to address council. Hello, yeah, I'm Mr. Zaretsky. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're what we're planning to do is construct a small uh, story and a half home there for Mr. Ballard, and uh, we're going to try our best to uh, get as much setback as we possibly can from the creek and also the front lot line. Uh, we've uh, like he's mentioned that we've have WSA Engineering. They feel uh, confident that we can build a good solid footing beside the culvert that uh, won't impact the culvert in any way, integrity at all. So that's the plan. It's kind of a tight lot. 
Uh, I've taken the project on. Uh, however, Mr. Ballad did buy a house prior to doing his homework on this. And I'm just trying to work with him and, and work with the city of trail to try to uh, make this happen. And it will be a nice little house. Uh, it'll definitely bring to the, the landscape a nice look for sure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zaretsky. Um, so there is a caller on the line with the last three digits of 210, no name associated with this. Were you intending to talk or have a question about this uh, development permit? Um, well, I was hoping to listen in on it. Uh, it's uh, Stu Grierson. Uh, my wife and I own um, 495 Rossland Avenue and 479 Rossland Avenue. And we uh, we really appreciate that someone's spending some money and in, in developing in the Gulch. So um, we don't have any problem with the requested setbacks and, and support the project. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who's joined us from the attendees that is here to speak on this or um, ask questions? No. Um, Ms. McIsaac, do I need to give Mr. Zaretsky a last opportunity to speak or are we good on this? No, it would be good. Okay, yeah. we're good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So the recommendation is subject to any input to be received from adjacent property owners that council authorize the issuance of a development variance permit to Morley Ballard to vary sections 38F and 86 of the zoning bylaw reducing this required setback from the Trail, Tree, Trail Creek culvert from 3.0 meters to 0.9 meters and the required front yard from 1.2 meters to 0.3 meters. Do I have someone to make that motion? Move approval, Robert. Councillor Cashoni, do I have someone to second that motion? Uh, Councillor Butler, thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this matter? No, nothing from council. Okay, we'll go for a vote then. All in favor? Aye. Against, if any? Carried, thank you. Um, and Mr. Zaretsky, you might want to just put your video on off now so that you're not showing up on the rest of our uh, on the rest of our film. Thank you. Okay, so 3.2 is appointment of the bylaw enforcement officer and Ms. McIsaac, you have the floor. Thank you, your worship. Um, the purpose of this item is to bring forward for council's action the appointment of James Tite, who has just recently joined the city as a bylaw enforcement enforcement officer in order to enforce the city's regulatory bylaws. Uh, pursuant to section 36 of the Police Act, council may appoint bylaw enforcement officers to perform the functions and duties and having the powers and responsibilities respecting the enforcement of the city's regulatory bylaws. James Tite has recently joined the city as the city's parking meter attendant and in order for him to enforce parking regulations as contained in our traffic bylaw, as well as to assist our bylaw enforcement officer in his duties, he should be appointed as a bylaw enforcement officer for the city of trail. And so with that, it is being recommended that pursuant to section 36 of the police act, council appoint James Tite as a bylaw enforcement officer for the city of trail. And it would also be recommended at this time that the appointments of Robert Dennis and Adam Spadafora be rescinded. So okay. moved. Thank you, Councillor Gadafoni Robinson. Do I have someone to second that recommendation? Sorry, I didn't see a hand. Councillor Doby, I give that one to you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments on this? Call Councillor Jones, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Payson. Um, just a quick question for Michelle. I'm wondering um, if we have changed the job classifications uh, or duties with our bylaw officers now that they are um, downtown dealing with our vulnerable um, community on a more regular basis. Has anything changed in that uh, in their classification? No, there have been no changes to the job descriptions for either the bylaw enforcement officer who would primarily um, be working with 
the um, vulnerable population in the downtown. Um, he is supported in that role, though, at, by the parking meter attendant. Um, but the job descriptions do provide adequate flexibility and other duties as uh, assigned. So um, because the bylaw enforcement officer um, does enforce uh, our traffic bylaw that deals with um, uh, the placement of chattel materials and whatnot on roadways okay. um, does form a, func a function of the role. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, any other questions on this matter? Seeing none, all in favor? Against if any? Carried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so item number 3.3 .3 is RDKB board representation. This is the first time we've kind of formally had this out in a open meeting versus a closed meeting. Um, so I just wanna, for everyone's sake, let you know what the process is going to be tonight and reiterate that. So um, in November, 2018, there was a resolution in a meeting to resolution 311-18 to move uh, decisions regarding regional district appointments from closed into open. So I am going to defer to Ms. McIsaac to introduce the item. And then I'm going to ask any councillor who has interest for the primary position of the regional district to indicate their interest. Then those who express interest um, are going to be able to speak to that. We're not taking motions at that time. I will then ask anyone else to speak on the matter. Then we're gonna do a vote by hands up for each individual. If there's more than one person that puts their name forward, staff will record the vote, but obviously that doesn't ratify it. You need a proper motion. So um, if there is um, a, a winner, I guess, a person with more votes, then a formal motion will have to be advanced at that time for the candidate with the most hands up and then we'll go to a formal vote. So that's the process for today. So Ms. McIsaac, I just wanna turn the floor over to you. You did a briefing note up for this to talk about regional district representation. Yes, thank you, your worship. In background, in accordance with section 198 of the Local Government Act, the municipal director to the regional district is appointed by the municipal council from amongst its members following a general local election. He or she will then retain that appointment until it is, is changed at pleasure by council, which means at council's wishes, until the director ceases to be a member of the council or until November 30th in the year of a general local election. Presently, Councillor Robert Shoney serves as the city's representative on the regional district board and has since his appointment in November 2018. He has recently indicated his intention to relinquish the position effective April 1st, 2022. So coming up in a couple days. And so from a procedural perspective, Mayor Pazin has um, spoken uh, about the process that will be undertaken. Um, but in, in years past, council has permitted any interested member to let their name stand for the appointment. And then council members uh, will have opportunity to speak to their background and after which council will participate in a vote to make the selection. Uh, the appointment to the regional board does require a significant time commitment over and above normal duties that come with being a city of trail council member. And it's certainly thought that experience and knowledge in local government process and procedure and familiar familiarity with the various regional issues uh, the city is involved with is considered to be an asset. So it would be um, important for council to make an appointment pursuant to section 198 of the local government act so that the city can remain represented at the regional district. Okay, thanks, Ms. McIsaac. So at this point, I would like to ask if there's any councillors who would like to advance their name for consideration for the primary position of regional district representative. Councillor Jones, thank you very much for putting your hand up. 
And is there anyone else? Councillor Butler, thank you for putting your hand up. Is there anyone else who wishes to put their name forward? Okay. So uh, now that the expressions of interest are indicated, I'm gonna ask the proponents to speak. Councillor Jones, if you would like to go first, please. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, the dogs were barking. Um, thank you for this opportunity of putting my name forward for this position. Um, I know I've expressed interest before, but um, this is actually, um, we'll be making it official uh, for myself. I've, um, just some of the experience I've had, uh, you know, I was with the government uh, in public service for over 32 years. And during that time, I had the opportunity and took the um, uh, opportunity to uh, become the vice president of the BC Government Employees Union. And during this time, I was actually responsible for over 63,000 members, which included the, um, you know, from corrections officers to child care workers, health care workers, um, teachers were in our membership, engineers, highway uh, crew, uh, and just to name a few, we had conservation officers and um you know, I had the opportunity to do bargaining, negotiating for these uh, members, uh, which gave me a lot of experience in um, uh, the work that they do. And during, also during the time that I was in public service, I was the manager of a government liquor store for seven years, um, having to work with budgets and understanding, uh, you know, government policies and procedures. Um, I know that this position is going to be, uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work and it's going to take some time to get to know everything, but I've started taking that opportunity early. Um, I've been uh, attending the uh, regional district town hall meetings. I've been watching their board meetings, um, attending their online workshops. Um, I have been uh, in conversation with Robert uh, about the work that he's doing at the regional district, and he's been sharing me information, reports on their budgets, et cetera, and which, you know, involves a lot of reading, and uh, it has taken a lot of time to get through that, but I've, I've found it quite interesting. Also, at this time, I sit on the uh, Association for... Um, the Kootenai Boundary Local Government as a board member. And that is a, um, it's a level of government uh, from the East and West Kootenays, um, not a level of government. It's a board that has representatives on it from the East and West Kootenays. And it's been um, quite an eye opener being at that level because I've been able to recognize and see that the issues that are happening in the West Kootenays are also happening in the East Kootenays. So it's been great to work with those people, with those board members, and come to a conclusion over issues that we're both facing. Um, in the end, I, I know it's going to be a lot of work. I have the time, and I would be honored to represent the City of Trail on the Regional District. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, Councillor Butler, you're next, if you'd like to say a few words. Sure. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to put my name forward for consideration as the RDKB rep. Um, I would like to be considered uh, for several reasons, and those reasons include economic development within our area. As you all know, I'm, I have a fondness and a keen interest in, um, in economic development and to see our cities thrive. I'd like to become more involved at a, uh, at a, at a, at a regional level. Secondly, good governance and process, admittedly, I am a little surprised that we have not collectively made a decision or the decision yet to replace the City of Trail representative at the regional level. And lastly, uh, I, for my own continued uh, self, 
uh, development and learning as a counselor, I am considering running again and, uh, and would like to uh, be able to actively participate going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on this topic? Are we allowed to ask questions or make comments? I don't know. Uh, I think you can make comments. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask questions. Ms. McIsaac, I'm going to defer to you for that. What do you think? It was specific to the experience of one or the other. It might be appropriate for council to better understand, um, but would certainly be um, open for council to um, make comments around the two representatives who have put their names forward. Okay, I'll try. I mean, it's not on to any particular candidate, whether it be Colleen or, or be, whether it be Paul, but um, I would like to know their, I guess not their position, but more or less their understanding going forward uh, and being involved with the budget process going forward with respect to the regional district. Uh, as I'm sure both of you know that the, uh, the um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? The amount of money that, uh, that the city of Trail puts into the regional district is considerable. And I just wanna know your feelings in terms of moving forward. Um, you know, over the past four years, since Robert uh, was there, you know, it's been reported out that, uh, you know, we have saved significant amount of money uh, from the regional, or the City of Trail has um, saved a considerable amount of money over the last four years. Uh, I just want to make a point, and, I, and, I, and this is where I want your position in terms of how you would go about it. Our requisition from the regional district of Kootenai Boundary has been pretty much consistent or been on the increase every year since 2014. And it's been consistent in the last four years. And Robert, if I'm wrong, you know, I, I'd ask you to, to correct me. But we had $860,000 of monies coming from the dam revenue, which used to pay for all of the administrative costs. So what we what the regional district uh, has chosen to do, or the people on the on the regional district, is take that eight hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars to fund <clears throat> to fund fire services and three other services, and then to pay for the administration, we took that same amount of money out of reserves. So that kept, uh, you know, I agree with Robert. It did it it didn't impact the city of trail because of how they've done it. But if I can put it in simple terms, when you dip into reserves, it's nothing, no different than your personal account. If you keep taking money out of savings and put it into checking to pay for your day-to-day -day expenditures, sooner or later, the savings account disappears. So based on the information that I received, two years from now, we are going to have to tax a fair amount to replenish those reserves. They're not there forever. They're, they have to be replenished. So I guess I need to know your philosophy. Do you agree that the amount of, I mean, there are times when you have to dip into reserves for operating as an unexpected expense that you didn't project for or budget for, and you have to dip into reserves. I guess my question is, do you agree with the strategy of utilizing all of your reserves to pay for operating because all you're doing is you're deferring the tax. So instead of paying a bit each year now, and I hear it's not sustainable from what I've been uh, told, it's not sustainable. And in two years, we're going to see increases to replenish, uh, replenish those reserves. So I guess my question to both Paul and, uh, and I wish you both luck. Uh, it, it is a lot of work. Um, what are your feeling of exhausting reserves to pay for day-to-day -day operations? Sorry for making it so long. <laughs> uh, does someone want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Sure. You no. can go ahead, Paul. No. Uh, thanks for the question, Sandy. Um, my stance on it is I, I think many of you are quite aware I'm, of my background as a banker, so I am a rather prudent kind of guy. Um, but also sort of a responsible, fiscally responsible individual. So um, as much as I see it as a way to balance a budget, 
Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's a way that we can balance the budget going going forward. And uh, inevitably, small but measured increases um, are needed to uh, to to not keep us in a position where we're just taking out of reserves consistently. Um, I'm not advocating that we uh, quickly increase, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think that we have to remember that as as economies grow, as inflation comes into play, uh, we have to be able to and be prepared to uh, to uh, um, make some hard decisions. And those hard decisions come with uh, sometimes a bit of an increase and not uh, taking from one pocket to put into the other. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Councillor Jones. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I agree with what Paula said, but I, I wanted to add that, you know, things a lot can change in two years. And I would want council to know that um, if I ever got into a position like that at the regional district, and I, you know, definitely would not move forward without bringing it back to council and getting your feelings and feedback on it. And I would hope that our seat our CAO would be able to help me through something like that, but I would definitely not make a decision um, that would be so detrimental or um, wouldn't be beneficial to the city without bringing it back to council. Fair enough. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you. So is there any other comments uh, from the floor? Okay, so I'm going to make a comment. Um, so, I can still hear you. I'm not invisible, but I'm still in distance. Okay. All right. Okay. So the vote for the regional district position is a statutory appointment involving a vote of council that was described by Ms. McIsaac. And at this time, um, you know, I've been I've been sitting on this for a, a little bit, and I am concerned at a lack of procedural fairness that may be present surrounding this matter. Um, after an initial email request by Councillor Doby sent March 7th, 2021 to have the RDKB appointment placed on the agenda, staff sent a follow-up email on March 10th, 2021, indicating that no action was being taken by the city on these matters until Councillor Kashoni provided written confirmation that he was relinquishing his RDKB position following his verbal commitment to do so. On March 18th, 2021, Councillor Kashoni sent an email to staff as follows. Hello, Michelle, I intend to step down as the primary RDKB representative effective March 30th. I have kept Colleen, other than closed items, up to date with all the budget figures, scheduled meetings in April and forward meetings, and all of the work plans scheduled for the rest of 2022. The major work plans include the upgrade to the sewer plant and also the reorganization and introduction of the organics program to the landfill. The budget has not been finalized yet and we are still waiting for the updated assessments before the budget can be finally approved. There will be a transition period where all of my files, both electronic and paper, will have to be transfer transferred over to a new computer for Colleen. I will be speaking with IT to assist in the transfer. The last meeting in March should then be the place where elections appointments to the regional district should be placed. I hope this clarifies the issue. Thanks, Robert. On March 21st, 2021, Ms. McIsaac replied as follows, Robert, thanks for confirming your intention to step down. I will, I will prepare a report for the March 28th regular council meeting with respect to process, recognizing that any member of council can put their name forward for consideration. I was also informed that on January 26, 2022, Councillor Kashoni mentioned at an RDKB facilitated session that he was training a new representative to the RDKB for the city of Trail which is why I'm speaking about this today. So these actions of self-selecting and training a new RDKB representative in advance of a duly convened meeting do not follow the rules of procedural fairness or good governance and frankly are extremely disrespectful to the City of Trail as an institution and every other City of Trail elected official. I do acknowledge that on August 16, 2021 at the regular council meeting over seven months ago, we discussed a change in the RDKB appointment. At that meeting, Councillor Jones declined the nomination to stand for election for the primary position, which would have unseated Councillor Kashoni from his position. She accepted a subsequent nomination for the alternate position to unseat me from that position, but ultimately withdrew her consent during the process. 
Based on Councillor Jones twice rejecting a nomination to sit on the RDKB, I am unsure why action was taken to train her in this role and transfer documents to her computer in advance of an election for the statutory appointment. Further, unless there was some level of certainty that four votes would be secured for her appointment, this exercise would seemingly be viewed as a misappropriation of efforts. If there was succession in mind, and it was thought that learnings and documents needed to be shared between elected officials in advance of a change of RDKB representation, the appropriate route have, would have been to contact myself as mayor and as the alternate RDKB representative. If training was to occur on RDKB matters, all of council should have been invited and engaged, not just a preferred candidate. During the last three and a half years together, is it, it has been advanced several times that there is concern about discussions that have happened before meetings between councillors to, to discuss and advance items. After such concern has been expressed, it defies logic while these actions continue. Self-selecting candidates and providing exclusive training opportunities for certain members of council when the position available is a statutory appointment that will be agreed to through a vote of council is entirely inappropriate and frankly undemocratic. Not only does this process initiated and accepted by councillors not adhere to procedural fairness and good governance, it also leaves the city in a position where this decision can be challenged due to a closed mind standard. It is of utmost importance that every councillor come to this in every other meeting with an open mind, ready and willing to hear all sides of arguments only after that should final decisions be made through the formal voting process of council. And so to close, before we move forward with this item, as mayor and CEO of the City of Trail, I wish to apologize to all those elected officials here today who were unaware of and were not asked to engage in exclusive training sessions to facilitate one's nomination in advancement of this very important day of decision-making for the RDKB appointment. So with that, uh, we are going to continue the process on. Uh, we have two nominees on the floor, and the process right now is a hands up for each individual. So I'm going to call first. I'll call uh, Councillor Jones just because she declared first, and then I will call Councillor Butler because he declared second. Um, and that is the only reason why I'm calling that order. And I'd just like you to hold your hands up so that we can, staff can make sure that they have the vote count. So all of those who wish to vote for Councillor Jones, please raise your hand and just hold it up for a few seconds. Two, three, four, yeah, okay. Okay, and all those who wish to vote for Councillor Butler. Okay, so it was four, three with Councillor Jones getting the nomination. Um, so I need someone to make the uh, formal nomination for Councillor Jones to be nominated to the regional district. And I also need someone to second that. I'll move that. Okay, Councillor Cashoni. And uh, do I have someone to second that nomination? It should be someone other than Councillor Jones. Oh, thanks, Eleanor. I didn't see your hand there. Councillor Gattafoni Robinson. Thank you. Okay. And all in favor? And against, if any. Okay, congratulations, Councillor Jones. You Jennifer. are our, our new appointment for uh, primary representative to the RDKB. Uh, Councillor Doby, go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to make a comment. I believe in one of the sessions uh, of council when there was a strong support for Councillor Jones going into the position. And yes, at that time she did turn it down, but she was very specific in saying that I would like to revisit this opportunity again. So I think in saying that she was putting her name out there that she was very interested in, interested in looking at the possibility of taking on the position at a future date. I just would like to make that comment clear. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Kishoni, go ahead. Well, I'm really disappointed in what you said, but uh, I guess that's just, that's just you. Uh, as far as the transfer of documents, there's been no transfer of documents. The transfer of documents will only occur, in fact, after the April 1st deadline. 
uh, as far as training goes, she expressed an interest a long time ago in this, and there was no one else expressed the interest. I thought Councillor Santori might, and uh, he said no, he was not interested. In fact, he was the one who nominated uh, Colleen, I believe, for, for the position. So it's quite clear that, uh, at least it was in my mind, that, that the only person who was really interested, and I'm sorry, Paul, if that's the case, the only person who was really interested was Colleen. I, I spent a considerable time I'm telling you right now, considerable time making sure that Colleen had all of the information because she will be on committees dealing with uh, 60, uh, $68 million in budget, $68 million in budget. And, you know, I needed to know, at least in for protection of the city of trail, I needed to know that we had somebody there who was ready to do that, had the time commitments for, first of all, the time commitment is a big issue. The meetings don't happen. The meetings happen for hours, hours during the day. So consequently, you know, I see nothing wrong in me providing information. Anybody who wanted information was free to talk to me. And I would have given everybody the information. No problem with that. Thank you. Councillor Santori, your hand up is first and then Councillor Jones. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's get on with this. What's done has been done. Good luck, Colleen. Congratulations. And, you know, uh, we look forward to you coming back to council with reports. And um, I was glad to hear that you will come back before making any decisions that either you're unsure of or not sure whether or not it's in the best into the city. Uh, this isn't doing us any well, pointing fingers at what was said and what was done. We went to a vote. It passed. Colleen is in. Can we move on to the next item, please? Well, Lisa pointed yeah. the fingers. No, I know, you Robert, I'm just saying, what are you talking about? Kind of harder, Robert, guys. Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm not accusing you, and I'm not accusing Lisa. I said, the vote's been done, so let's just move on now. And Councillor Jones, did you want to speak before we move on? Well, I, I yes, I actually do. I mean, the total comments that you made, um, Mayor Payson and Sandy Santori, Councillor Santori, I mean, totally. Um, what did I say? questioned my integrity and even my credibility to be in this position, quite frankly. And when you speak about the meeting on August 16th, you're right. Sandy was the one that nominated me. Paul was the one that seconded the motion and spoke um, towards it. I assumed that there was an opportunity there that I was going to be on the regional district. I reached out to Robert for the information, for the reports that he talked about when he was reporting back to council. He didn't choose me, I reached out to Robert and he actually quite easily um, shared the information because he knew that I was interested. I, th I, I, yeah, I'm ready to move on, wow. Okay. Once again, called. I hope that people are paying attention. I hope Colleen. the citizens of a trail are paying attention right now. What did I say that questioned your Sandy, integrity? I, I just, I'm, we're not going to. No, no, but hold it. I, I, she made okay. an act. You, you accused me of questioning your integrity. I congratulated and you wished you good luck and thanked you for your approach. So how am I? What did I say derogatory towards you, Colleen? No, you're right, Sandy. I included you in on Mayor Payson's speech and I shouldn't have. And I apologize. I apologize. No, you're right. You, you, you were actually very respectful. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to close this. And I, um, I think that the email sent speaks for itself. There are seven people around the table here who were capable of doing it. And regardless of uh, what was said seven months ago, does not give anyone a buy to have um, any preferential treatment or have an email sent that basically locks up their vote. And so um, it is what it is. Colleen, I too wish you good luck. And I just hope that going forward, uh, we adhere more to procedural fairness. And um, I, you know, I acknowledge that people absolutely act, ask for support with any nomination. It doesn't matter if it's committee or whatever it is, but there's a step where it's taken too far. Um, and I believe this was taken too far. So now we're moving into proclamations. 3.4, we have two proclamations. Day of action against anti-Asian anti racism and GBS. Excuse me, Lisa. 
When what? do we deal with the alternate? Or is that it's not, not on the agenda? Oh, okay. Thank you. Proclamations, Day of Action Against Anti-Asian Racism and GBS and CIDP Awareness Month. So there's two uh, proclamations that council proclaim May 10th, 2022 is the Day of Action Against Anti-Asian Racism and the month of May 2022 as GBS CIDP Awareness Month. And uh, GBS CIDP, just so that everyone is aware, is um, Ghislaine Barr syndrome, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So those recommendations are before the group. Does anyone Almost. wish to make those proclamations? Thank you, Councillor Gattafoni Robinson. Um, is there anyone to second that? Councillor Butler, thank you. All in favor? Against if, oh, I don't see enough hands here. All in favor? Against if any? Carried, thank you. Okay, and now we have 4.1 Council Indemnity Bylaw number 2916 2022, first, second, and third readings. So, Ms. McIsaac, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the annual indemnities that are paid to mayor, mayor and council must be enacted by bylaw. At the previous Governance and Operations Committee meeting, uh, a motion was passed directing that an increase of 2% be applied to the annual indemnities. The bylaw is, is set out accordingly for the mayor's position. The indemnity paid for 2022 retroactive to January 1 will be in an annual amount $40,214, uh, sorry, $40,214. And for each member of council, the annual stipend is $18,896. So it is being recommended that council proceed with first, second and third reading of the council indemnity bylaw number 2916 at tonight's meeting. So is someone able to make that motion to the recommendation? Move, Robert. Councillor Kishoni, do is there someone to second that motion? Councillor Butler? Okay, any other questions or comments on this? So no, go ahead, Councillor Jones. Um, so after uh, last council meeting, um, when we made this, de this uh, decision and moved it forward to the bylaw phase, um, when we came out, there were seven or several other communities that were um, reporting in the newspaper that they actually were having discussions about the same issue, the indemnity um, for councillors. Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there an opportunity for us as a council to actually sit down and have a conversation about this? I know that this is moving forward now, but um, is there the opportunity or the willingness for council to sit down and have a discussion about um, council indemnity before the new council comes into um, place in October or November or whenever it happens. Um, when I first got on council, uh, this was a huge topic of discussion. Um, I got in in November and of course it had already been set for that year, but the next year it was a big discussion. And I remember the CAO doing a report on it and saying that, you know, um, when he, uh, compared us to other communities in the area, we were behind a bit and uh, we did bring ourselves up to be close to some of the other communities that were the same size of trail, et cetera. But the discussion around council at that time, um, and it was, it's quite interesting that it's turned completely different this time, um, but it was based on the fact that we were doing succession planning, um, wanting to get uh, younger people involved in politics, um, involved in sitting on council. Uh, we didn't want them to experience any um, expenses. Uh, when we 
we put the indemnity up to what it is now, we were thinking that um, because things are, are changing so drastically and so quickly and things are so expensive, that the younger generation will be having to take time off to be on council and they should be reimbursed for that time off. Then they might have to get childcare and they shouldn't have to, um, you know, do that out of pocket. And some, some people that would be thinking of coming or, you know, running for council might have to pay for um, elderly care, you know, look, someone having someone to come in and look after their parents or, you know, everybody has different situations or different reasons, uh, you know, as to why they can't attend. Um, well, they don't have the time to be on council or be part of the um, municipal government. And I guess for me, I, I, you know, when when the other counselors were having that conversation and I'm lucky I'm older, I don't need child care, I don't need elder care, I, you know, I don't need transportation, I don't need all of that. Um, but I guess there is younger people that are interested in running if they didn't have to worry about that. And that's why we were putting the indemnity up to, you know, be on par with other communities. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I don't want people to think that, you know, we're making a bunch of money at this because, uh, you know, if you're running to do the, for, for council, you, you can't be doing it for the money because quite honestly, yeah, that's the wrong reason to be in politics, uh, to sit on council. And I can tell you that, you know, when you're out and about and you're going to these different organizations and you get invited to the different events and that costs you money, you know, whether you're supporting them or whether you're, uh, you know, you go to the market and you buy local and you're supporting different organizations and you want to be a part of different um, community events and committees and that it, it costs you money. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, it, it's disappointing when you're on social media and, and you see the comments that, you know, we're not worth that kind of money and we shouldn't get paid that kind of money. And then almost in the same breath as we're talking about it at the council meeting last time, I mean, our own mayor says that, you know, we're not worth it and we shouldn't be paying or we should be giving tax break, uh, payers a break because of what we've cost um, them in the last year. And quite honestly, the complaint that our past CAO filed and this, indemnity that we're looking for to be, you know, made sure that we're not out of pocket for the work that we're doing for our community is actually two different items that shouldn't should not even be brought up at the same time in the same breath, because one has nothing to do with the other. So I think what what I'm asking for is that we have a, a council committee that can sit down and actually have a discussion about what this is for and, and, and why we need it. And um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's all I have to say right now. I hope okay, the other council so, will have something to say about it. Yeah, so I'm just gonna make a comment and then I think, Sandy, you have your hand up, but I think Ms. McIsaac, um, you're probably gonna take the bulk of this one as far as process and procedure, because it is a bylaw. Um, so first, I I'll just go back. I think the reason that um, we did this, the larger increase the last time versus the standard 2% increase that we typically get is because there was a change in the taxation rate where okay. council used to have approximately 30% um, non-taxable. And so when I believe the federal government made that change, um, we most of the municipalities did do that that changed the adjustment so that council would come out on par. Uh, Councillor Jones, I will agree with you that uh, no one does this for money. You really, for the amount of time that people put in, um, no one's in politics for money, but I will disagree with the fact that I said that we weren't worth it. And I voted for a 0% tax increase for the reasons I stated. There have been high legal fees, there have been high expenditures, and I think this is one area where we can um, 
we can make a choice to cut. No different than if you have to make different difficult decisions with other areas of, um, of the budget to cut. This was one area. It would be no different than cutting off our grant program, anything like that. So just please don't put words in my mouth for why I chose to do make that motion at 0%. I was very clear. It was not the um, decision of the majority of council and that is fine. We go with the majority of council. Uh, Councillor Santori, it's um, over to you now and then to Ms. McIsaac. Well, you covered it. I was just going to uh, reiterate the fact that that one increase was because of the ch uh, changes in the, the tax and that 30% of it was non-taxable and then became taxable. Uh, with respect to the committee, Colleen, uh, in the past, what council has done, uh, it was either, uh, we have done it in the past where we had a committee of the community at large at one time to review our stipends compared to other communities. And then I believe after that, it was done pretty much internally. Uh, no, we're not the lowest and we're not the highest. I think we found ourselves in the middle of the road. So, you know, I, I don't know what a council committee, I mean, for council to meet on their own stipends, I think would be somewhat of a conflict of interest. Uh, if the next council chooses, uh, they may want to go to um, the community at large and pick people uh, and choose people to sit on that committee to do that review and then come forward, as opposed to seven council members deciding what their raises are going to be or to try to justify their own raises. Um, so, I mean, that's all I wanted to add. I mean, if, if you want a total review, then I would strongly suggest that the next council go to the community at large and pick people, uh, choose people uh, to come back to council with what their recommendations. So I don't know, is that you, Sandy? Who's nope. getting text messages back and forth? Nope. <laughs> Councillor Dobie, go ahead. Um, yes, I'd just like to speak to the kind of the financial end of all of this. Um, it was supposed to be a goodwill action on our part when this was explained to us to mm -hmm. not accept the 2% indemnity and that it would also help reflect our concerns on keeping costs down. Just in terms of the costs, I'd like to point out that for approximately two years now, we have been meeting on Zoom and there has been no cost involved in providing us with our suppers on our supper breaks. And I believe that's um, a savings over the two years of a probably looking at it in a lower uh, cost level of at least $50,000 or more. So there's been a substantial savings there. And of course, in the last couple of years, uh, nobody's attending conferences. We've brought in no specialized training. Uh, we haven't been attending UBCM. So again, with all of that, there's been a considerable cost savings. So I just wanted to bring that to the, uh, the eye of the public or the ear of the public. Uh, Ms. McIsaac, do you want to round this out? I got my finger up. My oh, hand sorry, up. I'm going to go to Michelle first and then, because she was prompted first and then I'll get you, Robert. And just with respect to um, timing, so we do typically consider the council stipend that's paid um, at the beginning mm -hmm. of the year as part of our budget discussions. Um, so I hear Councillor Jones's concerns around um, putting uh, some sort of structure in place for a review in advance of the next incoming council. Um, but I do want to just remind Council that there have been some external um, consultants who have undertaken a review of Council stipends in recent years. Um, most recently, I believe in 2016, Urban Systems did a review, and at that time it was found that Trail um, Mayor and Council were quite well aligned with respect to uh, the annual indemnity that is paid. There can be some variation in expenses um, that are paid from municipality to municipality, um, but looking just uh, quick overview of the urban systems report back from 2016 showed that there was fairly good alignment for a municipality of our size, population and complexity. Um, and since then there have been nominal increases. So whether it's been CPI or aligned with uh, the pay, 
increase to uh, the city employees, there have been increases year over year. Um, and the only exception to that was in 2019 when there was the significant increase as a result of taxation changes. Um, so uh, for a council committee to meet and have discussion around what uh, the stipend might be in future years. I would just caution council uh, around staff resourcing for that because we would have to support your efforts by providing information. And so it might be a matter for discussion as part of the strategic planning session of the incoming council to determine, does that particular item rise to, uh, to the surface, so to speak, when we're, when we're dealing with the competing, competing priorities requiring staff time and attention? Um, thinking back just over recent years, it does seem that council, uh, council's annual indemnities isn't far out of line and requiring uh, an overall review. Um, so those would be my comments on it if, if there is a real appetite to um, engage in a, a more um, wholesome or fulsome um, discussion at the council committee level. Okay, Councillor Kashoni, you're next. Well, I think it should be done before the new council comes in so they don't have to deal with it. Uh, that's what Rosalind has done. For example, Rosslyn has a committee of uh, council members and uh, they have recommended that uh, the mayor be paid, uh, I believe, uh, $30,000 for a uh, city with a population of 4,100 and councillors being paid $15,000 for that population. Our population is double that. And um, Revelstoke has also done exactly the same thing. They've, they've made those recommendations. I don't think there's anything, anything clearly connected back to 2016. 2016 is a different world, even with the problems and issues that councils deal with nowadays. It's not water, sewer, garbage. I mean, it's, it's, it's complex. And I, I really support what Colleen's saying about younger people. If you want younger people in here, you're going to have to do something about it. You can't expect these people to do that. You're looking at an inflation right now of 5.7%, and that doesn't include energy, food, or housing. And so the inflation rate is probably closer to 9 to 11%. And I'm telling you, it's very, very difficult. You're going to have a lot of trouble getting candidates, well, suitable candidates in terms of people running. There is elder care. There is child care. There is all this stuff. And I raised this when I was on the on the uh, school board and you know, I never went anywhere in those days, but I think now it's quite, quite different. So if you look at Rosslyn's rates and you look at, uh, if you look at uh, Revelstoke's rates, that would mean that the city of Trail, based upon population, the mayor would get $60,000 next year and the um, councillors would get $30,000 next year. That's, that's, what, that's what those numbers generate. And I've, I've looked at the numbers, there's doing a number of committees or operating my understanding from talking to people in the Okanagan, they're doing the same thing because they can't get people out. And, they, and, when, they, and when, they, when they do get people out, sometimes they get people out they don't like. So anyways, I think that it would be well, well advised to have some sort of a small committee. And we don't really need a lot of staff time, at least I don't, I don't consider it staff time. I think a lot of the research can be done by council members. I think I have to talk to Andy Morrell again and Rossum, but I think they did a lot of the research themselves. But anyways, thank you. Okay, Councillor Doby, you had comments? Yeah, I'll be very quick here. Just to support what Robert and uh, Colleen have said, I think if we look around at all the, the councils in the area, we don't see many, many young people. I think just about everybody is in retirement age or close to retirement. So I think that kind of confirms what they're saying about the younger people. And this next election will be a, a really good example to see what happens. Okay, so Councillor Butler, go ahead. I would just like to politely disagree with Councillor Doby on that. If we look at Nelson's council, young people, <coughs> radiums, young people, uh, there's many examples where young people are stepping up to sit on council. And I, and I don't necessarily uh, think that uh, money is, is the reason that, we're, that young people are doing it either. So I just want that voice to be heard. Thank you. Do we know what the stipend is in Nelson? 
Ms. McIsaac, would you happen to know that? I didn't do the uh, comparison of this year. I don't know if there, those numbers would be available. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Santori, go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything, but I don't know why we're wasting so much time, people trying to justify their income and daycare and everything and all these other things that actually are quite irrelevant. People, this is not a full-time job for anybody. I mean, I was on city council for 14 years and I managed Kootenai Savings Insurance. And I don't think there's one council member sitting around this table that didn't have a full time or other than Colleen, you were already retired, that others had jobs and doing this. I mean, if we're to increase the stipend for a councillor, well, give them a $5,000 boost, a $7,000 boost. That's not going to be their primary job. And it's not going to make any difference whether they attract young people or not. I mean, but to sit here and try to listen to everybody trying to justify their salaries. Come on, you guys, let's, we have bigger fish to fry than justifying what we earn. People know what the salaries are before they run for city council. If you don't like what it's being, what's being paid, then don't run for city council. I mean, you can't apply for a $15 job, take the job and then say, I'm not getting paid enough. I want more money. I mean, you know, going in what the counselor makes and you know what the time commitment is. And if you don't accept those terms, then don't run for city council. It's pretty simple. A $10,000 raise isn't going to feed a family of four. So nobody's going to take a counselor's position as a full-time job. So let's not kid ourselves, okay? It's your full-time job that's going to pay for your daycare and it's going to pay for all that other stuff. Not your city council stipend. So let's okay. Quit justifying what we're making, my God. Okay, so we're at 4.1 Council Indemnity Bylaw 2916-2022, first, second, and third readings. The recommendation is that Council Indemnity Bylaw 2916-2022 receive its first, second, and third readings. Do I have someone to make that motion? So move. There, please, you do okay. have a mover and seconder. Um, oh, sorry. For that sorry. Motion on the floor. It's been so long, I, I forgot. <laughs> Can you just refresh me then who moved and seconded? Councillor Kishoni, who moved it in, Councillor Butler seconded it. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions on this matter? Uh, Councillor Doby, you're leaving the screen and we're going to a vote. Do you want to come back so I can get your vote recorded, please? Okay, so the recommendation is before you. All in favor? Against, if any? Carried. Okay, so now we're on to council committee reports. Uh, Council Koshoni, you're first. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a bit longer because this is a basically a wrap up account. There'll be one more, one more report later, but uh, this one here is uh, going to be somewhat detailed. So the budgets are done except for the last, um, assessments coming in. There may be a small adjustment. I spoke to um, Barb uh, the other day about it, and she doesn't think there's going to be any real changes in the in the numbers. So I'm going to go through them quite quickly, but in case the media wants to pick them up, because some of these numbers are quite important. In the 700 sewer cost, is that's tied to these new cost allocation policy. And um, also we needed to hold on to reserves to prepare for the uh, secondary sewer upgrade. Now here we pay 70% of the costs. And because we are a smaller group, the administrative costs have increased dramatically. In fact, almost all of the costs in terms of the 700 sewer service came from the increased cost allocation policy of what was $50,000 of an increase. We did keep a substantial uh, reserve in order to make sure we're not short on the big projects. The solid waste, the board fee again is up considerably. That's the uh, cost allocation policy, the policy that I opposed, by the way. And we pay 21.3% of this particular uh, of this particular solid waste uh, program. Uh, we held on to a large reserve here because of McKelvey Creek. Uh, the reserve is almost $3 million, and this is the case where you need the reserves. And what you have here is you're going to get two new scales at McKelvey Creek. You're going to get the road upgrade, new buildings, transfer station, water lines, a new recycle area, 
and of course, seven hundred thousand dollars, which we got as a grant for the green bin, means that we're not going to have to pay for the bins when we start the organic diversion. Now, the only people who are going to have to pay for the bins are people who want bear-proof bins, and that's when I should there. The Boundary Organics was paid for by a $2.3 million grant, a $1.2 million from the sale of the airport, and $1 million saved from the Multi-Materials BC takeover for the recycling. The um, McKelvey Creek, of course, now has that $700,000, the uh, which is the... Um, the grant for the bin. So you're looking at about um, 2.334, almost $5 million in grants in order to, to do these particular projects. And uh, it's going to be a great thing for the city of Trail. We're going to save a tremendous amount of money. Now on the loans, if you have a $250,000 house, it's going to cost you 71 cents a year in 2022. <coughs> And then it'll cost you $6.88 per year for the next 20 years. If you had a $500,000 house, you're going to pay $1.43 for the entire year extra. And then $13.76 per year for the next 20 years. But we don't anticipate paying that loan for 20 years because we are going to use as much of the surplus as we can to offset that loan. So... The cost for a $500,000 house for a complete rebuild and the implementation of organic diversion comes down to $1.14 a month. That's what the actual cost happens to be. The projects are going to save, well, millions. Is it going to extend the life of the landfill by at least 40 years? In fact, in Grand Forks, we're looking at a little bit longer than 40 years extension. Now, emergency preparation, this budget here, this is a download from the provincial government. It is now costing the regional district $414,000 a year. <coughs> we have to get some provincial relief, provincial assistance, and this budget actually had to be increased by 30% in order to meet the needs. Arts and culture is going to be 0%. And we saved $75,000 from the use of reserves that we don't need. And this saves the city of Trail 34,992 for 2022. The transit, it is a 0% budget increase. We've kept $150,000 in from the dam revenues for 2022 and beyond. The hundred and $50,000 from dam revenues does not come from taxes and to correct Councillor Santori, it doesn't come from reserves. The money that comes from the dam is money that is paid by the provincial government into the, into the coffers and can be used for a variety of ways. And we've chosen to use it, for example, there. This $150,000 that's being transferred in will be transferred in and continue to be transferred in for all of the, all of the, um, downtown trail exchange. So the entire downtown trail exchange will be paid for not by taxpayer dollars, but will be paid for by the money transferred in from the dam. And also it is going to be paying for all of the bus shelters, the renewal and the upgrade of every bus shelter in the entire area. So it's a great program and it was supported hundred percent by the East end. In fact, all of these motions on the money that has been transferred, all were report, all were supported 100% by the East End. The liquid waste, the $63 million upgrade, we have a $46 million in grants and starting this year. We've hired the consultants to manage the project. And uh, this particular project is going to bring in substantial um, economic activity for the entire area. The board budget, just for example now, is now $91 million. It's up considerably. In 2011, I went back and I looked at it and it was $32 million. So it's moved from $32 million to $91 million. And in 2021, it was $55 million. So when you're on the 
particular board now, you're managing a great deal of money, even though we don't, uh, you know, we are not in every service. The board itself is responsible for the entire $93 million of budget. We've actually extended the trails because we have a lot of people been asking about it. We've extended the trails and we've increased the Trail Society grant to $90,700 per year. And of course, we should know, or the people should know that the city of Trail pays 40% of that particular cost. So the East End is, the East End is um, very, very concerned about the trails because it seems to be where the new um, recreation is going. So the background budget since uh, 2019, almost $3 million has been diverted from the dam revenues into East End services. These are not reserves, these are revenues, taxes. And this has saved the East End taxpayers over $3 million and the City of Trail over $1 million in four years. Further, in 2022 and beyond, $860,000 per year will be diverted, saving the East End taxpayer this much every single year. And we'll save the city of Trail $260,000 per year for every year into the future. Now, this could not have been accomplished without the support of the East End members and of the board at large, because the vote was taken at the East End and the vote was taken at the board at large to do this. As to the 2022 budget, simply for the city of Trail, the budget has increased by $75,000 but it was originally set at $280,000, and that's what it was going to cost us. And we care by careful examination of the various budgets and operations, and by the cooperation of staff, and I would like to compliment them, and the board members, they've reduced the budget. We have been able to reduce the budget for the City of Trail from $280,000 down to $75,000, so you're taking a look here now at um, a savings of $200,000 by careful examination of the budgets. The breakdown on uh, 2021, we paid in $4,656,993. For 2022, we paid in $4,732,173. Or we have a 1.16% increase. So that's all we have is a 1.61% increase. And most of that is tied up in the big projects. So for example, in 2019, we had a 0% increase, 2020, 0.88% increase, 2021, a 0.1% increase, 2022, a 1.61% increase. So your average increase per year over the four years and the budget years has been decimal 6475%. And with that, we're going to be getting a new landfill upgrade and a new sewer upgrade. Our percentage at 1.61 in comparison to other municipalities and areas. Mount Rose is 10%, Rossa 9%, Warfield 10%, Area B 2.7, Fruitvale 5%, Greenwood 23%, Area E 11%, Midway 10%. Those are the numbers that we got or I got the other day from the um, from Barb and uh, in that particular section. So we've done very, very well and we've protected uh, the taxpayer as much as possible and we have used the reserves that we can use effectively and we still have for the information for there we have over 12 million dollars still in reserves so it's not a question of drawing down reserves dramatically we still have 12 million dollars sitting in reserves so i'll have one more report in april to well some final issues and I'm pleased that uh, Colleen is now going to be taking over the primary position. And uh, I've got every confidence in her and in her ability to do so. She's very determined. And I would like to thank the directors 
of the East End and of the board for their confidence and support over these three and a half very, very difficult years. They have all done their best to provide services at the lowest possible cost to all of our constituents. And I think that you, you have to understand exactly how much work some of these directors have done over the course of these three and a half years. And savings, of course, we were talking about savings. By going to Zoom meetings, cutting travel, we saved $387,000 last year alone. And we're online to save another $300,000 this year. And the trail is going to save 23% or 21.3% of that over $600,000, which is another set, whatever it happens to be, 20% of $600,000. So that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Councillor Koshoni, for your uh, final large regional district report. And on behalf of Council and the city, we'd just like to thank you for your service on the regional district for all those years. And I do acknowledge that COVID has been brutal on municipalities, whether it's uh, you're an area, a regional district, or a city, or a town. Um, it's just been brutal with budgets trying to manage that and make really difficult decisions. And um, I'm glad to see that we, we seem to be coming out of COVID, but knock on wood for that, um, there's still gonna be a lot of difficult decisions ahead for all of us. So uh, with that, is there any questions on Councillor Koshoni's report before we move on to Councillor Gattafoni Robinson? None, okay, Councillor Gattafoni Robinson, you go ahead. Unfortunately, Mayor Pays and I've been spending most of my time at the arena at the uh, minor provincials that were held here last week. We had a we had a lot of good teams. Unfortunately, Trail didn't win, so that's how things go. You can't win all the time. But other than that, I have nothing to report, Your Worship. Were you working in the snack shack, or were you uh, in, in the, in the, or watching in the, in the spud shack? Oh, good for you. Yeah. Well, it was nice yeah. to see so many. Um, people just around during that first week of spring break too. It really made downtown vibrant. So yeah, it's great that yeah. we could open up the arena for them. And thank you for all your volunteerism with uh, the uh, the food purveyance there at the arena. Councillor Santori, you're next. I have nothing to report. Okay. We didn't have a GOC today. Councillor Jones, go ahead. I have nothing to report. Okay. Councillor Butler, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, just uh, on, on the 16th, I attended along with Councillor Jones and yourself a very informative uh, and, inf and inf uh, information luncheon uh, that was hosted by the City of Rosland to help us better understand the importance of the traditional lands of the Sax people, um, which I found uh, tremendously valuable. There are many things that we can all do uh, it, uh, and things that we can do to help acknowledge uh, things where, and, and the importance of you know where we're living, where we're playing, and uh, where we're working here on these traditional lands. Um, other things that I'd like to also mention is it's important that we uh, remember to speak up when we hear that the Sinaiics are not are not mentioned, and that all of us can take responsibility in the health and well-being of these traditional lands and all that it contains. And then secondly, on the 23rd, I attended the monthly Chamber of Commerce meeting. So uh, um, I think it's an important uh, part of our, our common heritage here. And uh, um, I just wanted to uh, bring that to everyone's attention. So that's the end of my report. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Councillor Butler. And I will agree that the presentation on Indigenous representation in Rossland was very interesting, and I'm sure Councillor Jones would agree with that as well. Uh, Councillor Doby, you're up next. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. Um, just before I start my report, I'd just like to indicate that some of these, probably most of these background noises tonight, I had a security system installed in my house yesterday. Yes, on a Sunday. 
Talos came in and installed it. And uh, I keep hearing voices in my house. The system talks to you and it sends you messages and you think you've got things shut off. Anyway, but most of those noises were the fault of me. So I apologize. I'm not sure how well we're, how I'm going to get along with this system, but I'm trying. Okay, just a quick couple of pointers here under the um, incredible market, the um, Fruitvale, Village of Rootville is joining the farmer's market, which will mean we'll have two in the area. And I think we'll probably see both the markets trying to support one another and come up with some joint ideas. I believe that the Fruitvale um, market day has not yet been announced, but I'm sure that's coming. We are having an Easter market out at the mall again, as uh, is compared to the Christmas one, but I believe we'll only have between 45 and 50 vendors at the uh, at the Easter market. And I think they're trying to tie it in with the activities that go on at the mall for the Easter egg hunt for the, the younger children and a few other events. Just a quick note on communities in bloom, the uh, hanging baskets have already been delivered to uh, Diorama and getting them ready for hanging in uh, June. And they've now started the cleaning of the big planters and some of the downtown areas, you might start to see them out in the next little while. And we had a big job. We have an awful lot of calla lilies and uh, we took on the big job of splitting all of those. So it'll give us the benefit of seeing more calla lilies planted in the area. So that concludes my report, Mayor Payson. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Doby. Any questions for Councillor Doby? Seeing none? Okay. I'll go with mine. Uh, I've got a few things to cover here, so I'll try to go quickly. So the first set of meetings I attended are around our vulnerable population. So the Trail Community Action Team meeting, 100 Tiny Homes presentation and supportive housing meeting. Um, all these groups continue to do good work to support the vulnerable population and are liaising with each other very effectively. Uh, they're focusing on enhanced social media outreach to our community, community media, um, education initiatives, and lobbying for an OPS, safe supply, naloxone training, and housing solutions. Many of those initiatives, the funding lands with the provincial government, but they're committed to their advocacy work. Uh, there was significant discussion on toxicity of drug supply, which remains a concern. And also they spoke about the um, amount of memory loss and brain damage that is happening with people who are continually overdosing, which is uh, very sad. I want to thank all our community groups who are continuing to collaborate and work together and continue to be engaged uh, to help our vulnerable population. Um, you know, as we get into nicer weather here, you're going to see that the vulnerable population is going to start moving. You know, they're not going to be tucked in for winter anymore. Uh, they're going to be outdoors. So we're talking about strategies around that, what to do if people want to tents, uh, attend, what to do with porta potties. So the group is working through that. Uh, some good news is that the UBCM Strengthening Communities Grant is open for another intake and CDS along with the city will reapply for funding to support community outreach. So the last grant in intake that we did um, provided, I believe, two, I'm not sure if they were both full-time, but full-time uh, two community outreach workers. So uh, CDS is hoping to extend that contract if we can get extra funding. They found it to be a very, very high benefit for our vulnerable population and the rest of our community. Uh, over $5,000 has been raised for the coldest night of the year, and that's an approximate total. The last time I looked, it's not the final total. I had the honor of meeting with nine of the ambassador program candidates, uh, along with Ms. Lucini, a session on local government was provided following a Q and A. I wish all the ambassadors the best of luck over their next months as you move through the process of training. And I hope you really take, take the time to enjoy the life journey that you're going through. We had an air quality working group. We met to discuss phase two of community outreach. This is focusing on air quality and trail and affected populations such as children, elderly, and those with existing respiratory ailments such as asthma and trying to have some um, uh, brochures and pointed outreach to them because they are a more vulnerable population with respect to uh, uh, fluctuations in air quality in our community. So, Fifth is the West Kootenay Boundary Regional Hospital District meeting. It was the budget meeting. 
So we moved through the process of approving the bylaws for the major equipment expenditures and the global grant for minor equipment. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the items that were approved just for KBRH. The, the list is quite extensive, so I'll just tell you what's relevant, more relevant for us. So planning, so planning dollars put forward for a new MRI equipment at KBRH. This includes new equipment as well as a building extension. So the MRI wouldn't be a portable trailer anymore. It's a high priority for our health authority. IHY digital health, medicine stations for pharmacies. So that's drug dispensing stations, uh, laboratory middleware, which enhances and streamlines operations in the lab, navigation system for our ear, nose and throat physician a ceiling lift with a scale for the renal unit, space lab central monitoring systems for obstetrics and multiple beds for medical surgical and the operating room. When considering taxation, the final result was a 0% tax increase this fiscal year. This results in a slightly decreased assessment for trail over 2021. So 2021, our, assess our assessment was $450,136. And 2022 is now $432,516. We were fortunate with a 0% tax increase that trails assessment went down slightly. That wasn't the case across all the other um, areas in the hospital district. So in summary, a 0% budget was approved with a taxation amount of $4,827,000, um, a contribution to reserves of $1.86 million as well. We also discussed UBC topics of interest, which, became, which will be continued forward. Um, I just want to answer Councillor Koshoni's question on lab services, which he advanced the last at our last meeting. So the, what, uh, what I have back for a discussion offline as well as uh, with Interior Health, as well as at the council meeting or the board meeting table. So the request to increase lab services was submitted to Interior Health for consideration of capital inclusion on February 2nd, 2019. The proposal included increasing the number of collection chairs as well as a record location in trail. In regard to relocation of the trail lab community collection services to a new site, this was reviewed as part of our capital process for the 2022-2023 fiscal. Unfortunately, with many other capital needs before us working within our capital funding available, we were not able to move forward with a new lab collection site for the trail for trail this year. Uh, they provided some background on the current location. So current collection site has ability to see up to three patients at a time. On average, they see 125 to 175 patients per day. The current location has no ability to add physical space, which I think that's not new news to anyone here. Although their long-term plan is for a larger location with the downtown, within the downtown area, with space to see up to five to six patients at a time, there are some bridging options that are available. So extending the daily hours, adding Saturday service, and both options are subject to staffing being available. The staffing right now is the bottleneck in the system. It's the major challenge and it is IH's priority with several initiatives underway. <coughs> First is relocation of the Trail Lab Community Collection Services Project that will remain in the capital needs assessment and, will be, and that will be reviewed as part uh, of the upcoming 2022, sorry, we always work a year ahead, 2023, 2024 fiscal year capital budgeting process. So let's hope that goes through for next year. Despite the staff resourcing challenges in the Kootenai boundary, there have been some new initiatives to help with staffing. So six medical lab assistant training positions have been funded via the Skills Centre initiative, of which two positions have been designated for KBRH and one for KLH. We are in the process of getting these training positions filled. There is also a new pilot phlebotomy training program that has been initiated by Interior Health. This program is being piloted in the central Okanagan and if, uh, and if successful, we will increase the rollout to other areas of IH lab services, including the KB. And then some sponsorships were also initiated by IH in which they were able to offer um, to one of, their, of our lab technicians, students in KBRH who will be starting full-time in March of next year. So they're hoping to expand to more training positions within the IH lab service in the future. So that's where we're at 
They're working on staffing. It's the major bottleneck right now. Um, potentially adding daily hours or extending the services is uh, on the radar is a high priority, but we need the lab uh, workers to be there to take care of that. And then the enhancement will remain on the capital list. So the other thing I just wanted to say to council, now that we have some new appointments uh, at the regional district, I will be looking over the next week at our council committee. I realize we only have until October, but there is a shift now in uh, workload for people. So I just wanna make sure that there's a more equitable workload um, of participants around the council table. So I'll work on that uh, over the next week and then get that to everyone. So those are my uh, reports. If anyone has a question, I'm happy to answer them. Councillor Dobie, go ahead. Um, I appreciated what you've reported to us on the labs because I've had two phone calls uh, concerned that they're hearing that the labs might be closing the odd Friday because of staff shortages. So is that just rumor or is there any truth to that that you know of? Um, I can't speculate. Uh, that was not discussed at all as far as that level of specifics um, okay. on lab, but from a broad sense, staffing is a significant issue and we're seeing shutdowns of beds and areas and scale backs all across the health authority with yeah. the lack of personnel. So it wouldn't surprise me, but that wasn't discussed. Okay. Well, I hope our, our new principal out at Southwood College or our new president is is listening to this and is going to be more encouraged to get some phlebotomy training in the city of trail Selkirk college council or Selkirk campus rather. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that mayor Paisen. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, any other questions on my reports? No. Okay. So we're on the, to the consent agenda. So we have seven items on the consent agenda. Uh, Councillor Jones, Mayor Paisen. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Did you put your hand up, Councillor no, Jones? Yeah, she hasn't. I did. She hasn't reported. Okay, I didn't see it. Oh, where did I miss yes, you? Yeah, I reported. I said I, I had nothing to report. Oh, sorry, oh. I didn't get it. But I, I did have. Did you have a question? That, yeah, no, okay. not a question. I wanted okay. to report. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I forgot this earlier, and um, Eleanor sort of twigged my memory. But the Trail Curling Club hosted this past weekend the BC Curling uh, Club Champion ships for 2022. So there was uh, 14 uh, teams that came in from around the province. So uh, nine men and five women, and they were from Comox, um, Nanaimo, Cloverdale, Nelson, Langley, uh, Castlegar Trail from all over the province. So that's probably why it was a little bit uh, busier downtown as well. I volunteered uh, for the weekend and uh, it was just a fun event. Like it was busy, people were happy, uh, lots of good comments about the facility and uh, the city of Trail, how friendly everybody was. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody heard that. Great, thanks Colleen. And, and sorry, I just saw your chat message to me pop yeah. up now. I missed that, so sorry about that. Um, and thanks for volunteering for that curling club event. Okay, on to the consent agenda. So there's seven items on the consent agenda. The recommendation is that they be received. And if anyone wants to pull anything out after, we can take care of that. So do I have a motion to receive the information on the consent Move agenda? Robert. Uh, Councillor Cashoni, do I have someone to second that? Uh, Councillor Doby, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Against, if any? Carried. Now, does anyone want to pull anything out? Um, oh. Go ahead, Councillor Doby. Um, no, I'm not. Okay, um, just on the letter from the City of Cranbrook, should we also send a letter in support of that? I mean, we've talked about our library funding just about every year, and uh, I do have to say, just on the recent library report, we got you know they're doing extremely well in managing their budget. Um, I had that pulled out as well. So, do you want to make a motion to? provide yes. a letter of funding a request for increased funding to public libraries yeah in support of the original letter that we received from the city of Crownbrook, and so okay. maybe send them a copy of our letter so yeah, absolutely um, yeah, the motion make would, yeah the motion would be that we send a letter to the minister in support of increased funding to the library of the city of trail and actually all bc municipalities 
Okay, thanks. So Ms. McIsaac, I'll let you uh, words with that. Councillor Jones, did you want to second that motion? Yes, I am. Okay. I am going to second, but second it. But I also have a comment on it. Okay, go for it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, at the uh, Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Government um, conference in April, there is also a resolution coming forward for the exact same um, issue uh, to increase the uh, funding of the public libraries. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions on that issue being taken out? Okay, all in favor? Against, if any? Carried unanimously. Anyone else want to pull anything else out? I'd like to pull out number 6.6. .6. Um, I was also approached the, um, from a citizen about this to donate $1,000 to the Ukraine through the Red Cross. Um, it seems like the city of Nelson has put out a challenge to all municipalities, which are being taken up by others. Rosslyn has taken it up. I believe Castlebar has taken it up. So I would like to put a motion on the table to donate $1,000 um, to the Red Cross to support Ukraine humanitarian efforts. Second that motion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Doby. Does anyone have any comments or concerns or questions on this? Okay, all in favor? Against, if any. Carried. Thank you. Okay, uh, new business. Is there any new business from the floor? I do. Councillor Santori, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pays. And I was going to bring this up uh, to the meeting two weeks ago, but unfortunately, we had no regular council meeting. So I am going to comment on this. Um, like I specified in the past, I've been on council now for what, 20? 21 years and 25 total in the public service. And uh, I've been honored and privileged to be able to serve in the capacity both as a counselor and as a mayor. And I take umbrage to both Councillor Jones and Doby with their comments in the newspaper in a continued effort to try to do me reputational harm. Uh, with respect to the seriousness, of the, the seriousness of the complaint filed against me. I'll deal with the seriousness of that complaint, but I think it's important, and many people have asked me, and I'm sure they've asked you, is what brought you to make these comments? What put you in that position? And I'm, I think I owe it to the community to be specific, and I'm, and I'm going to attempt to do that. So, this all came to a head back in, we all know when it came to a head, back in last June when our CEO filed a complaint against Councillor Kashoni. And it turned out that Councillor Kashoni was found to have been in violation of uh, the Code of Conduct. Uh, it turned out that uh, there was a settlement involved. So I guess my question, specifically to Councillor Doby and Councillor Jones, who were very sanctimonious in the comments that they made. Uh, and again, with, a, a, with the intent to continue to try to do me reputational harm. So with respect to the complaint that was filed by our CEO against Councillor Kashoni, which led to his early departure, a settlement, and hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would like you to respond. And if you choose not to, that's your prerogative. Do you think that complaint was as serious as the complaint filed against me or against Councillor or Mayor Pazin? Do you think it was less serious? Do you think it was very serious? Or do you think it's no big deal? Okay, so I'll, I'll comment. Sure. So, so I think any claim that gets put in against any councillor or the mayor, I take them all very seriously. Hmm. I think my point was that what happened with the complaints that went in from four of us councillors regarding yourself and regarding Mayor Pazin was that this was ongoing. This was, wasn't one incident. The complaint with uh, Councillor Kashoni was one incident and I've looked at that many, many times. It was a total of seven words that were spoken. And that out of those seven words, one of the words was the word David. So based on those seven words and one being the name of David, we're only talking about six words that were spoken. And the final report to me was far lighter. But I think the thing that 
really <laughs> bothered me the most, and I spoke to this at, at once, one council meeting, was mm -hmm. I was of the belief that, yeah, okay, this went through. Robert was found in breach of the code of conduct. We agreed on a press release. For me, it was all done, but it wasn't with council. Yourself and the mayor continued to bring this up and were pushing us forward to take further action. And I just, for the life of me, I said that at one council meeting, I could not understand why it, we, we've done it. We've dealt with it, it's finished, but it, it wasn't finished. It was continued. And I, I think once the, 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 um, the results of the investigation, I mean, these are all handled by special lawyers that deal with nothing but these kinds of issues. Once it comes through and we put whatever we want to put in the paper and comment on it, it's over and it's done with. But that wasn't the case with Councillor Cushoni. So I guess it was, for my part, it's a lot of frustration. And you had just said earlier, let's not spend so much time on, on oh, the- No, no, no. I, I do want to spend some time on this, Carol. First of all, let's just be clear. I did not continue this on. Just Mayor a point of order. Is this is this in order? I mean, I don't understand what you're yeah. doing, Mayor Pazin, I, I, well, allowing this type of conversation. This is this is outrageous. I am, as far as I'm concerned. Hold on. I, Robert, outrageous. Do I, have, do I not have the right outrageous. to defend myself? Hold on. I am not going to idly sit silent while all these mistruths are out. Write a letter to the write a letter to the newspaper, Sandy. Don't. No, don't I'm not going to write a letter to the newspaper. Grandstand here, please. And I have a. I take offense to that, and I want an apology right now for grandstanding. Yeah, I apologize for telling you not to grandstand. I apologize for it. I've put too many years under this council to be criticized by these two, and I am going to defend myself. And then the people can, if you want to challenge what I have to say, I totally respect that. If you want to defend yourself, go ahead. But I'm not going to idly sit silent after 21 years of commitment to this community by their feeble efforts to do me reputational harm. So for the record, it was over. It was you four that filed a complaint within 48, no, sorry, 72 hours of the press release. Hold, let me finish and then you can talk. You guys issued a complaint within 72 hours. And I have another question for you, Councillor Dovey. What was your position when it came to issuing a press release and being honest and truthful with the citizens of Trail? What was your position with respect to the press release and why he left and the cost? What was your position then? And please, I have it here. Are you talking, which press release are you talking about? The press release that went out regarding the complaint of David uh, that David Perahuda filed against Councillor Kashoni and to name Councillor Kashoni in that press release, what was your position? Well, we all voted in favor of it. I asked you what your position was. Well, I supported the press release. Um, I I'm not sure I know what you're asking and I don't understand why we're going back to a press release. We're going release. back because I am here to protect my reputation, which I have every right to do. Now, if you want to know the details, then I would make a motion now to release the minutes of the June 17th meeting. Somebody want to second that for me? I can't I, remember what's in the June 17th meeting. And you know what? I don't about, really understand where you're, you're going. You're talking about it. closed meetings. I don't think this is appropriate, Mayor Pays. Well, no, I don't know what you're doing. At this it's point in time, I refuse to Excuse make any me. further Excuse comments. Me. And if you're wanting, if you're wanting an apology because you're upset, Councillor Santori, no, no, I no, apologize no. for the fact that the wording in the press release or any comments we made thereafter no. upset you. Other than that, you have no further comments coming from me. Uh, well, I didn't think so. First of all, Robert, if you can file a complaint of things that were said in a closed meeting. I have every right to defend myself in terms of what put me in a position to say some of the things and some of the gestures. You cannot pick and choose what comes out of a closed meeting, because if that's the case, you should have never had the right to file a complaint about what happened in closed. You cannot prosecute and not allow a defense. That's not the way it works. I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. I don't either. Yeah. You're just rambling. I don't. I really? Okay, let me ramble with that. So let's have a motion to, to adjourn. No, I don't I want, want to, to adjourn. adjourn. Excuse me, Your Worship. Do I have the right to speak? No. Are you the worship? No. I'm, oh, because, because you're afraid of what you're going to hear. 
when this goes on, when this Ms. goes Mikhaizek? on, YouTube, they won't be believed. I would just like well, to check with you for process. This. Want me to read what Councillor Jones's position was? Do you want me to read it? Do you want me to read it? Point of order. We just asked Michelle for uh, a process order here. <laughs> so I didn't want to interrupt um, there. Okay. I, um, if I understand where Councillor Santori um, started with his um, commentary here, it relates to newspaper reporting that was in a recent edition of the Trail Times. Um, it does go back a little bit because we didn't have a regular council meeting and he was, uh, I believe, trying to seek clarity around some comments that Councillor Doby and Councillor Jones made publicly in the newspaper. I think it would be uh, appropriate if either Councillor wished to respond, keeping, um, I'll say, the answers germane to the topic. Uh, as you wander uh, a bit with respect to the commentary, you're treading uh, a fine line around um, conf confidential information that yeah. uh, should be protected. And um, so with respect to the responses that Councillor Santori was seeking relates to the newspaper reporting and the investigation findings of the council complaints against Councillor Santori and Mayor Pazin. So I would ask in your responses that um, you restrict your answers to that matter and that investigation um, rather than looking farther back. Uh, and I think it would um, uh, serve uh, a purpose for Councillor Santori to hear those uh, replies if Councillor Jones and Doby are willing and forthcoming. I'd ask you, they don't have to answer the question. I just wanted to know if it's, Carol, you answered it, whether or not it's as serious, less serious or more serious. And I've got one more thing to bring up and I'll ask you if it was serious. Okay, we're not gonna get a response on this, but. Anyways, this will come out. Uh, apparently, uh, is uh, from the reading file. There's three FOIs that are going to go out, or have been requested for FOI of the report. Yes, I can. I can confirm that um, the recent investigative report has been requested through formal Freedom of Information and Protection of, of Privacy uh, Act request for records. Well, then I'll save the other document uh, for when that comes out, which I have absolutely no problem in that in report going out. But I want to speak about one last issue and just to get comments as to whether or not uh, the council members find this serious, because this is a personal violation against me. On August the 16th of last year, we were informed by our acting corporate administrator that the minutes of the June 20, or that the, the, minute, uh, the meeting on June 28th that was held was recorded without the consent or acknowledgement of any council members prior to that. <coughs> At that time, I asked, and I want to know if you guys think this is serious. I asked who recorded the meeting, how long has this been going on, who was it shared with, where are these recordings stored? And did anyone help with these illegal recordings? Not one of you said a word, not to accept, uh, admit or deny, not Robert, not Carol, not Colleen, or not Eleanor. Not one of you said a word that a closed and confidential council meeting was recorded without anyone's consent or knowledge, which by the way, is in violation of section 184 of the criminal code and also the freedom of information and the protection of privacy act. At that time, the CAO did not disclose who provided the tape. On September 27th, after seeking legal advice and the question was asked as to who recorded it, the response was it was given to her by Robert Cashoni. Again, at that meeting, I asked who recorded the meeting? How long has this been going on? Who has this been shared with? Where are these recordings stored? And did anyone help with these recordings? 
Again, Councillor Doby, you never said a word. Councillor Jones never said a word. Councillor Robert Cashoni didn't say a word. No one, not a thing. Pollard Butler expressed his concern that he felt personally violated. And I'm so, personally violated. Well, hold on. So do you think it's a serious offense to violate the Criminal Code of Canada and the Protection of Privacy Act? Do you think that's serious? I think it's serious enough, but I think you have to understand that when the question was asked, we didn't know. What makes you assume that all of us knew something that was going okay. on? Well, I'll ask you now, Councillor Doby. Did you Pardon? record it? I'll ask you now. Did you record the June 28th council meeting? No. Councillor Jones, did you do it? No. Councillor Gattafoni Robinson, did you do it? No. So that leaves one. So it's Councillor Cashoni. So it's well, Councillor but you didn't ask Paul and you didn't ask Lisa. They already said it on the at the August meeting that they didn't do it. So, Paul, did you record it? No, Councilor Santor. Mayor Pazin, did you record it? I did not. No. So, as suspected, it was Councilor Robert Cashoni who was dishonest, deceitful, unethical, and a total breach of trust. You can smile, Robert. Well, I, I think I think Lisa should be embarrassed, ashamed of herself, and embarrassed. Oh. To let you go on like this, to tell you the truth, it really? is un it is unbelievable that she, as a mayor, <laughs> would allow this to go on because this is just a farce. Is it Thank a you. lie, Robert? Is it a lie? Thank Am you. I, I'm, I'm not going to talk oh to you anymore. God. Nobody, nor should anybody talk to you anymore. Thank you very much, Robert. So you're, but you just should know this has been advanced to the RCMP. The RCMP has already forwarded it to Crown Council. Now it's up to them to decide whether or not they will proceed. You might get lucky. They may have too many fish to fry. Better things to do than dealing with your dishonesty and your deceit. And it's also in the hands of the privacy commissioner's office. So we'll see what happens to that. But I'll put those aside. What you did is a total breach of trust. Not only is it a breach of trust of counsel, it is a breach of public trust because the citizens don't know how long you've been doing this. Where are these files? What other information have you shared with the public? So if you think that the mayor is out, is out of order because she's allowing me to speak on a violation of my rights and you're telling me you want her to stop, the citizens of Trail need to know, need to know exactly what's been going on here. Well, I'd just like to add a comment, comment to that about what the citizens of the trail need to know. And unfortunately, a lot of information that they need to know has been enclosed. And a lot of that information was ongoing uh, torment of us, harassment, uh, creating indignity amongst, amongst us. And it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. That's why we finally resulted in putting our claims in. So we can't speak to those issues because they were enclosed. But we've gone through a lot of threats. <laughs> high pressure uh, uh, spe speeches from certain members of council on certain issues. And the biggest issue was to deal with Councillor uh, Councillor Koshoni. And because it was enclosed, I can't release the issue. So when we talk about that kind of conduct, yes, there has been a breach here and there has been a, a conduct. But as far as I'm concerned, what we have put up with in council in the last couple of years with <laughs> I said the indignities, the, the way we've been pressured, the way we've been stressed. And I want to say on a very fine line, at times we feel like we're, we're being threatened, has been far, far worse since it's been ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. All of the things that- And I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the meeting right now. We haven't adjourned. Yeah. I'm yeah, quite I frankly, know, I've had I, enough. I know you want to leave the meeting, but everything that you are suggesting took place in the report, harassment and everything else, was not found to be true. None of it was found to be true. And I cannot wait until the FOI request is fulfilled because this is not coming to an end. I am not going to let you totally try to destroy my reputation. This is going to play on episode after episode. It's going to be like Survivor. And then at the final episode, people get to vote people out. But what you did, Robert, was dishonest, deceitful, and a complete breach of trust. And we'll let the people decide whether or not I'm right or you're right. I've had my say. 
but I am not going to allow you. Yeah, you can smirk and smile all you want, Councillor Kishoni. Thank okay. you for your time. All right. Uh, any other comments? Nope. Okay, department reports, 8.1. There's a bylaw enforcement department report, February, 2022. The recommendation is that this report be received for information. Do I have someone to move that? So move. Councillor Gattafoni Robinson, thank you. And Councillor Butler, all in favor? Against if any? Carried. And move for adjournment. 8 p.m. Thanks, Councillor Butler. Good night, everyone.